welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. I want you to stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to pray. And let's go before the Lord God Almighty today. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord We're grateful, Father, that we haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from an old man or a young man. We haven't come to hear from a tall man, short man, black man, brown man, white man. We have come into the house of God to hear from the teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us. Encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in your house this day. As you bless us, we are grateful people. But Lord, we would ask that you bless all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination. We thank you, Father, for Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia Church. We thank you for the way. We thank you for San Bernardino Temple, Lord. We bless our Adventist brothers and sisters and our Catholic brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom. Not a man's, no, no, not a man's, but yours. May all the praise and glory go to you. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. With a great big shout, we say, Amen. Amen. Pastor Luke. Well, as you're being seated, if you've got your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Hebrews in the seventh chapter. Today I'm excited. Are you you excited to be in the house of the Lord today on this greatest day in history? Praise God. I'll tell you, man, that that was a dismal clap for an Easter Sunday. I mean, come on, this is the greatest day that we celebrate in history. Praise God. So I had you turn to the book of Hebrews in the seventh chapter. And as you're turning to Hebrews, the title of this morning's Easter message is Remembering the Empty Tomb. You see, in our lives, in our society, dating back to several hundred thousands of years, uh, we, as humans, have always had something that we've done to signify the life of somebody. Now, now, if you go right up the road on Waterman Avenue here in San Bernardino, you'll find a cemetery. And at those cemeteries or at those places of burials, you'll find that people, uh, when they're buried there, they put a, a marker, they put a headstone, or they put a, a, a tombstone there. That's something of the, of the state that says, here lies, or in loving memory, or rest in peace, so forth and so on, to to signify that a person, that that particular person came, that that particular person uh, lived their life, and that particular person has died. But today, we're going to talk about the idea of remembering the empty tomb, because, you know, you and I, when when our time comes and, and, and our time has passed, and we die and leave this place, we may have a marker, we may have a monument or an urn or something of that, that nature, but the fact is, is that we're going to leave this place, and there will be something, a, 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 a remembrance or a legacy behind us, but there's something that I want to point out to you. And that is no matter where you go, no matter how hard you look, no matter how many different stories or accounts you read, it does not matter. You will never, you will not find a marker or a stone that says, here lies Jesus Christ. Because death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him, the tomb could not withstand the power of God. And so today, this Easter Sunday, the greatest day that we celebrate in history, you know, the the revolution and July 4th and our nation's holidays and every other thing, those are wonderful days. But this is the day we remember and we celebrate, the day that nobody else has come and done this since and will ever do it again. And that is the resurrection of our Lord in Jesus Christ. And we have got to remember in our lives 
We have got to remember the empty tomb and what the empty tomb means to us. So when we talk today, we're going to, Pastor Dan, myself, Pastor Jim, we're going to bring three simple thoughts to you today about what the resurrection means to us and things for us to take away so that not just on Easter Sunday do we remember the empty tomb, but rather every day of our life as we go about life, we can remember what the resurrection means to us. And so number one this morning, the resurrection means to us completion. It means that it is complete. Jesus Christ has come and has died and has risen again. And that means to you and I, completion. Now I had you turn to Hebrews in the 7th chapter. And let's go ahead and read in verse number 23 of Hebrews in the 7th chapter. Verse number 23, it says, Also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. You see, there, the, the Bible right here in Hebrews in the seventh chapter is talking about Jesus Christ, our great high priest. This is something to you and I that may be foreign or unfamiliar. You see, we don't live in a time of high priest. Yes, we do live in a time of representatives. And what a high priest was, was a representative to God, from God to man and from man to God. It was the middle man between mankind and God. You see, all the way dating back to the, to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell in sin because they took of the fruit of the knowledge of tree and good and evil, there was a gap or a chasm between man and God. And to serve that gap, uh, there were high priests or representatives who God used to speak to the people and God used to represent himself to the people and the people to God. And by way of, of mere mortality of mankind, there were many high priests. Why? Because nobody has, has been gifted the ability to live forever. And so our representative to Jesus Christ was continually changing. You think about it much like this in our day and age. We have representatives all over the place. We have representatives in Washington, D.C. We have congressmen and senators. We have uh, representatives in, on the state level. We have mayors and councilmen. We have a president uh, that, that is limited by law or limited by their, their terms of office. And so what happens is as, as time progresses and as, as time goes on, our representatives continually change, much like the Catholic Church has as a representative called the Pope. And as the Pope goes and as the Pope one comes to the next, they bring their different ideas and they bring their different mindsets and they bring their different lives, much like in the political world. When one president comes, they bring their agenda and the next president comes, they bring their agenda. So it's continually evolving and continually changing. But Jesus Christ being our great high priest is, 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 our, is our cornerstone, is our rock. You see, we don't have to worry about things when it comes to us and God continually changing. Why? Here's why. Verse number 24. But he, speaking of Jesus Christ, because he continues forever has an unchanged priesthood. You see, no longer do you and I have to worry about what is our relationship with God going to be like? What is it going to be like? Is it going to be the same as it is tomorrow? Is it going to be the same tomorrow as it is next year? Listen, the world is going to change. Your lives are going to change. Your family are going to change. Your careers are going to change. The politics of, of, of our day and age are going to change. Everything in this world is changed. I heard the statement one time that the only constant is change, but the truth is now is the only constant is Jesus Christ. Why? Because he continues forever. And he is our eternal representative. In verse number 25, it says that he is also, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You see, Jesus Christ is now our great high priest, our wonderful representative. There is no change. The Bible tells us in Hebrews in the 13th chapter, we sang it this morning, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because he continues forever, he is able to save to the uttermost. Let me tell you something. There is nothing that can stop Jesus Christ. There is nothing that can hold the power of God down. Why? Because death, the final hurdle that mankind had to face, Jesus Jesus conquered, and Jesus conquered not by the power of a man standing at his grave, but rather Jesus completed the need for mankind to have a Savior. Why? Because by the Spirit of God, he was resurrected from the dead to bring us closer to God, to bring us to God. And now you and I, the Bible says, 
has a great representative, an eternal priesthood, one that will never change, one that has completed what needed to be completed, and he makes intercession, he makes mediation, and he stands next to God on the seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father, making intercession for you and I on our side. Jesus has completed what needed to be completed, and now Jesus is on your side. And I'll tell you what, there is something great about the completion of Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen? Pastor Dan? Amen. God is so good. Remembering the empty tomb, what the resurrection means to all of us, number one, it means completion. Our life is now locked in with Jesus Christ forever. Second thing that it means to us today is it means power. You see, if Jesus wasn't risen from the dead yet, then death would still have power over Jesus. Why? Because, hey, he would still be in the grave today. See, if Jesus wasn't risen from the dead, then that would mean that the devil still has power here on the earth. And yet, because Jesus was raised again, he has power over death, and he also has power over the devil. He took back the keys of the kingdom, and now he has ascended on high. And one more thing, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then that would mean that we are still in our sins, sin would still have power on the earth, and then we might as well eat, drink, and be merry. Why? Because tomorrow we die. And yet we have the power of God, the resurrection power over sin. Now we're no longer a dirty old rank sinner like we used to be. No, now God has cleaned us up. He's given us a brand new life. He calls us a saint, and now we are in Christ Jesus, seated at the right hand of God, complete in him by the power of of God. Turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 1, please. Romans chapter 1. We're going to take a look at verse number 1 through verse number 4. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 1 through verse number 4. It says this, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Everybody say the gospel. Well, that was about half of you guys. Everybody else, come on, join in with us. Everybody say the gospel. See, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're proclaiming today. See, if Jesus Christ was dead, if he was still in the tomb, then he had no power, and there is no good news for us to proclaim today. Oh, but listen, Jesus Christ is risen indeed, and now we have the best news that ever could be spoken. The church has the best news that possibly could be preached, and we can't stay silent about it. Take a look at verse number two, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Verse three, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, verse four, and declared to be the son of God. Now, hold on a second, because see, Jesus was born in the lineage of David. And yet there were many people who were born in the lineage of David. Many men and women had come before Jesus Christ that were in the line of David. And yet something separated Jesus. Something declared Jesus to be different. Something made Jesus special. What was it? Declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. See, it was in the resurrection that we find out that this is no ordinary man. This is not somebody who was raised by someone else, as Pastor Luke beautifully expressed. No, this is Jesus, raised again by the Holy Spirit, declared to be the Son of God, and now he has the power over death, the power over the devil, the power over sin, and he gives it to us. Are you listening? Jesus told the disciples, if I ascend on high, I will send the power of the Holy Spirit upon you. See, that's what separates us from all the other world religions. Some people could say, well, you have a holy book. We have a holy book. You have a holy man. We have a holy man. You've got followers. We've got followers. You have places of worship. We have places of worship. But the one thing that separates us is we say, your holy man died, and he's still there in the grave. Our holy man was no ordinary holy man. No, this is Jesus, the Son of God, resurrected, and now he's seated at the right hand of God and continues forever. You're there in the book of Romans. Turn back to the book of Acts chapter 4. Jesus now gives this power to us. He now has given us the Holy Spirit. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that's resident on the inside of every believer. Those that are born in the Spirit of God have this power. Let's take a look at it. We see the disciples, now apostles, now sent ones, now the church of the living God, preaching and teaching and going out and doing great things by the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, verse number 33. Look at what it says. And with great... What? Oh, come on, that was weak. And with great what? Power. The apostles gave witness to what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon 
them all. See, as they preached the word of God, God backed them up with miracles, signs, wonders, and gifts of the Holy Ghost because that same power that raised up Jesus from the dead now lives in us. Now we have that power to preach. Now we have that power to live a godly life. Now we have that power to have a great family. Now we have that power to have a great business. Now we have that power to be a great witness for Jesus in everything that we do. Come on, let's give God a praise as Pastor Jim comes. Powerful. Isn't God good? I'll tell you. So we're talking about a wonderful subject. We're talking about understanding and seeing and remembering the empty tomb. Every day I've got to remember that the tomb is empty. Every day I have problems. Every day situations come on my life. Every day, and you do too, have pressures that come. Every day you question how you're going to make it. Every day you wonder where it's going to come from, that which you need. You have to remember every day that the tomb is empty. Number one, Jesus is not somebody who's just passing through. He has completed the job. Number two, it is the power of God that raised him from the dead and proved that he's the son of God. Yes, but it is also the power of God that dwells on the inside of you. I love it like this. Jesus tells us what to do, when to do it, how to do it, warns us of all the things that we should not be doing so that we don't travel and fall into pits of this world and find ourselves a, a derelict from the things of God. But he also empowers us with the Holy Spirit. That same Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that wants to take you and do great and mighty things in the future that God has for you. God has a plan for each and every one of us in here. My part, number three, is the word hope. Very important for us. There's three things a wise man wrote that a man needs to have in order to be happy. Number one, he needs to have something to do. Number two, he needs to have someone to to love. And number three, he needs to have hope in tomorrow. And Jesus Christ is the greatest hope. Let me explain what I mean. When I was a young boy, as a teenager, as a, as a baseball player, I was a professional baseball player at age 17 years old with an athletics organization. I had great hope that maybe my giftings and my ability could take me to some place to be successful. It didn't work out. In my 20s, I was released and found myself in jobs trying to make a living. Then I found myself in foolish hope, hoping that I could probably have maybe Maybe you thought this too, a relative somewhere way back someplace that you don't know that may die and leave you enough money to be successful. Has anybody ever hoped that in your life? You know, you know I'm talking to you. That was foolish and silly. And some of us even went foolish and more foolish and silly. We had hope in silly things like gambling. Remember when the lotto came out, I wasn't much of a Christian in those days. I could hardly wait to get two bucks down and hope and then sit for a while dreaming about what would happen if I won the lotto. Don't smile at me all that religious like you've never tried it and never thought about it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. In fact, if you win, you better tithe. <laughs> But that kind of hope is silly and that kind of hope is foolish and leads us nowhere. Because you see, when you have hope in yourself, you have hope in your ability, you have hope in your talent, hope in your gifting, hope in your intelligence, hope in your degrees, hope in your connections, hope in your job, hope in your retirement programs, hope in your neighborhood, hope in the government, hope in somebody else doing something on your behalf, you have got false and foolish hope. But when you put your hope in a God who cannot fail because the tomb is empty, now it's no longer based on your feelings. It's not no any longer based on your intelligence. It's not based on whether or not you have degrees or the smartest person or the talented or the gifted or the most abused 
beautiful person. You are now put your hope in a God who can come alongside you, take you further than you ever thought you could go, accomplishing things you never thought you could accomplish, fulfilling the plan that God has for you, ending up in a place where you're totally and completely blessed, wondering how in the world did you ever get there? You got there because you had hope in God. I'm telling you now, without hope in God, there is no future. In Galatians, the second chapter, Paul writes these words. I'll pop them up on the overhead for you. And he writes these words that are so amazingly dynamic. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Every one of us that are born of the Spirit of God, and if you're not today, you're in the right place, you will be before you leave. But every one of us that are born of the Spirit of God, you have been crucified with Christ. And when he went to the cross and he died, your old man died also. At least it should have been. And then he comes along and he says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And what we fail is we try to do it ourselves. We live in ourselves. We think about ourselves. We think about our own ability. We think about our own talents and giftings. We think about our being in the right place at the right time in order for us to have a future when in fact it's really all about hope in the God that can make that work for you. Open the doors that no man can open and close the doors that no man can close. That's the God you celebrate today. He's not just an empty tomb for himself proving that he's God. He didn't just have the power on him to raise him. He didn't complete the job just for that. But while you're here on earth, he wants to bless you, give you purpose, give you destiny. And he wants to give you a hope that far surpasses any thinking that you could ever have or anything you possibly could accomplish in yourself. He says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, there's a life you are going to live here in the flesh. He says, in the flesh, I live how? By the faith of the Son of God. If you don't have your faith in the Son of God, when problems come, when trials arise, when pressures take over, when situations you cannot figure out, if you don't have your faith in God on how you're going to make it, how you're going to make it with your kids, how you're going to make it on the job, how you're going to make it with your finances, how are you going to make it when you get older? How are you going to make it when you get married? How are you going to make it with your kids? If you don't know how you're going to make it, I'm telling you, you're in the right place. Get off of living for yourself and live for Christ. Put him in there as the answer to the future. I'm a couple of years away from 70 years old. I've never had more hope and Faith in my entire life for the future. And I'm not talking about eternity. I'm talking about while I'm here in the planet. You say, why? Why would you do that? It's not because I don't hurt. It's not because I'm not tired. It's not because I don't enjoy laying down. It's not because I don't like naps. It's not because I don't feel. My feelings have nothing to do with what God can do for me if I can believe him. The Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. Let me say it again to you. All things are possible to him that believes. Not some things, but all things are possible to him that believes. who loved me and gave himself for me. The last couple of verses in the book of, the third chapter of Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, the third chapter, verses 20, it's an interesting verse. It says, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to Pastor Dan's part, to the power that works in us because, Pastor Luke's part, because he completed the job. But listen to this. Now to him who is able to do not just what you think, exceedingly, abundantly, above or more than all that you could ask or think. Man, don't tell me that's not hope. Don't tell me that. I've got this thing thought out, and quite frankly, I don't see myself going very far. 
Well, get off yourself and live in faith in him and watch him who can do anything, who created the heavens, created the earth, holds the moon in its right place, puts the stars in the sky, has the sun at its right distance so we don't burn up. He's the one who walks on water, opens the blind eyes, raises the dead. He's our God. He's almighty God. Almighty. What is it that's too difficult in your life for him? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. What is it in your life that's too difficult? The tomb is empty. I tell you, he is worthy. Some of you need breakthrough in what you're hoping for. In the Old Testament, they marched around Jericho seven times. There was no breakthrough until they opened their mouth and shouted. Now listen to me. You listen to me. You listen to what I'm saying. Some of you have been believing for this and that, healings and life and don't know how you're going to make it. You need a breakthrough. Today is your breakthrough. If you... Be as silly as those people marching around Jericho seven times and then giving a shout. Some of you are too conservative. Well, I won't do that. It doesn't make sense. Hello? You're going to have a real hard time with God because God's way beyond our common sense. Some of you need to stand to your feet, open your mouth, clap your hands, Jump in place because you got hope for tomorrow. And let me tell you something. There's a breakthrough that you need to shout about. Stand to your feet and give them a shout and break through today in hope. Jesus! 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 What's his name? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. What's his name? Jesus. Woo! Ma, 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 ma. Didn't that feel good? You need to shout during the week. Jesus! Man. All right, now if you can, sit down. <laughs> Ooh, glory. Sorry I got a little Pentecostal on you there. Whew, hard to hold it back, you know what I mean? <laughs> Woo, I get excited. I got hope. It's not based on me. Based on me, I'd be asleep on the couch right now. <laughs> Based on him. What can stop me from the future that God has except myself? Same with you. There's many of you in here today right now that need to get right with God. Before you leave, stop and think about what I just said. You need to get right with God. We've clapped, we've sung, you've heard the word of God, you saw the dancing, it was wonderful, fabulous. But somehow you stayed in your seat. Thank you for doing that. You were wonderful. But there must be a reason some of you may need to get right with God today. And how sad it would be, stop and think about it, that you heard the music, sang the songs, clapped, cheered, shouted Jesus that name, Walked outside, went to your car, heart stopped, bang! You died and you went to hell. How sad would that be? Today is your day of salvation. You don't get to heaven because you do your once a year thing at church. You don't get to heaven because you're a nice guy or a good person. You don't get to heaven because you hope you're going to make it. You don't get to heaven because you say you love God. You get to heaven because... You follow the instructions of Jesus who tells us exactly how to get to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. 
So here's what Jesus is saying. You can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee way. If you want to go to heaven and have eternal life, then God brought you here today. This is a divine appointment for you. You've had a lot of appointments with doctors and attorneys and painters and plumbers, but today you have one with Jesus, a divine appointment. And today is your day to get right with God. You say, well, how do I get right with God? Jesus said you must be born again, John third chapter. Most people hear those words born again, turn off. Because Hollywood's portrayed born again people as fools and idiots and fanatics, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. Born again means this, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it means you have given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. That's as simple as that, is giving God all of your heart. It isn't coming to church shouting Jesus. It isn't coming to church listening to me or the other pastors. It isn't coming on a regular basis singing songs or being a good person that fits into society. From the beginning, the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, he's after all of your heart and all of your life. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth and stop playing church. Today is your day of salvation. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. I will prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. All or nothing. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. You've heard of it. Jesus is talking. He says, when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a blunt, rude statement. I'll vomit you from my mouth. You've got to be kidding me. That's, that's, that, that's, that's harsh. Yep, but he's serious. What he just said by making that statement is really this. People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're not going to make it. They're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. That's a shock. Lukewarm. Christianity. They call themselves Christians. Think they're Christians is the worst spot you could ever be in because you never try to get out of it until somebody comes before you and tells you the truth. You can't stay lukewarm and make it to heaven. You're going to have to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. And here we are in the house of God today. You've experienced God. God's talked to you. There's been a shout on the inside of you. You know that this has been an opportunity. You have been encountered with the Holy Spirit. Do not let this time pass by. Today is your day of salvation. Today, God brought you here for a reason. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give him all of your life. Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is this. I don't want to have just Jesus in my head like most Americans. You see, guys, I already know you know who Jesus is. Head knowledge doesn't get you to heaven. The devil knows who Jesus is. He's not going to heaven. It's not about just having head knowledge. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. It's about what you do with your heart. It's about giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life being born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. And if you want that completion to be in your life, you want the power of God to be in your life, watch this, and you want the hope for tomorrow, then you've got to live in him. And you can't do that until you make the first step of giving God all of your heart, giving God all of your life. Thank you for coming today. We love you so much. But don't leave this place without giving God all of your heart. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do it? Let's do it God's way, not my way or your way. 
Again, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up and you can put it right back down. How simple is that? You say, Pastor, you want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. Yep, you might be. Get over it. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like the church than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. No one's that dumb. Don't let the devil lie to you now. If you know you need to get your hand up, get it up. Who cares what anybody thinks? Let God see it. All across this auditorium, hold on, we're getting ready. Hands are already going up. We'll do it all at the same time. Is that okay? So hold on, we'll do it all at the same time. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, in the foyer by television, you folks that just left that are listening to me on your way to your car, I'm talking to you. You need to stop and come back and tell an usher that you need to get right with God today and not walk out of this place. Your eternal life is at stake. Today is your day of salvation. I'm going to count pop my hands together. I've done my job. Today is your day of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 80 19, 20 to 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64. The little girl back there's got two hands up. 63, 64, 65. It's like Debbie. That's what Debbie did when she was little. 64, 65. 5, 6, 6, 6, 7, 6, 8, 6, 9, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody in this family room? 80, how, many, how many over there? Five? Okay, 84 and 5 is 97. What? You expect me to know everything? Isn't God good? All of you that raised your hands, here's what I want you to do. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Sorry, I get, real, I get real tough with people, you know what I mean? Walk, don't walk out on our service. I'm going to knock you out, man. And so <laughs> then repent later. And uh, all, all 90 or something like that. Thanks for letting me do that. All 90 of you, I'm going to give you instructions right now. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. Now, wait a minute. No, <laughs> no one leaves during this period of time. You know what that, yeah, you get it, man. You look, uh, see the usher up there? Wave at me, Lionel. Lionel going to take you out if you walk out of here before. Look at the size of that man. I got him back there for a reason. So you better, <laughs> so you better be nice. All 90 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get a friend. If you need a friend, I want you to get out of your seat. Come out of the family rooms. Help them ushers out of the family room. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. The rest of us are going to stand in the foyer. If you just got saved and you raised your hand and you're not going to mess around with God, get in here also. Come on, let's stand and welcome them as they come. Jesus, I believe. Just squeeze right up here. Everybody up here in front, let me talk to you just for a moment. Right over here is a guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Joel. 
Pastor Joel is a good guy. No weird stuff goes on. Can I tell you what he wants to do? He wants to take you over to the side of the church and beat the snot out of you. <laughs> I'm only playing with you now. I'm only playing. You weren't the ones that left. You're the ones that stayed, so we won't beat you up at all. We love you. And Pastor Joel, sorry, Joel. This is a serious time. Uh, three things he wants to do with you. Number one, he wants to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You got to do that, you know. He, 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 he doesn't come into your heart unless you invite him. He's a gentleman. And so, very important. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information, literature that you can take home that's free, easy reading about now that you're a Christian, like what to do next, okay? What does God want from me, okay? Easy stuff, okay? Follow the literature. Third thing is so simple, he's going to introduce you a program that we have. It's called Spiritual Personal Trainers. We don't want you to fall through the cracks. We want you to come on board. Let us, let us help you. Let us get strong together. Let us have fun in the Word of God. Let's learn how to do life God's way instead of your way. Now watch this. Here's what I mean. If you'll give God a year, we promise you. Tell me if I'm telling a lie. We promise you that you're going to get totally blessed for the rest of your years on this planet. It's going to be amazing. So come on. Make a left turn. Make a left turn. Make a left turn and follow Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give them a hand as they go.